The first of our speakers is Susanna Hanna. <coughs> Susanna. Susanna Hanna. Susan Hanna. And the title of her piece, or, or the present, presentation she's giving, is The Mirage of Sovereignty and the White Man's Burden. <laughs> the role of media in the modern imperialism of Syria. This is most interesting. Thank you very much. Sorry. Susan, just don't wait a second. Yes, yeah, sure, I've still got to put my PowerPoint up, so. Okay. No, that's right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll be talking to you today about the equal application of state sovereignty. It is a mirage that exists in international law. The concept of the white man's burden has been used for centuries to justify impeding sovereign nations when they are in need of white saviors. I suggest that today the United States and her allies impede on serious state sovereignty and this is excused and propagated by the mainstream media constructing a narrative that the reasons are purely on humanitarian grounds. Through analysing examples of media articles, we can understand how content, structure and word choice shape the media rhetoric that supports the Western government rhetoric of events. You guys hear me? That's yeah. perfect. Okay, sweet. So I talked about content, structure and word choice. That's what we're going to analyse in today's media analysis part of it. So based on my primary observations reading mainstream Western media, the media diluted the legal concept of state sovereignty. It shifted the focus on international law and emphasise the concept of what I call the white man's burden. And I take that title from a poem that I'll be talking to you about. So just, if that doesn't make sense, I, it's going to be explained in a sec. So I decided that the key question is going to be, how has the Western corporate mainstream media's presentation of the war neglected serious legal rights to state sovereignty? Now to answer that, we're going to ask a few sub-questions. So what are the legal issues in the Syrian crisis? Using content analysis, what patterns emerge from the corporate media's narrative? How does the propaganda model affect the reading of these articles? How has Western alternative media and non-Western media in English presented the war? And how does the white man's burden shape the media narrative? Throughout this analysis, I'll be sharing excerpts from Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden as I think the poem is as applicable to the reasons for America's intervention in Syria today as it was when it was first written in 1899. I did want to do a literary analysis, however, because of time constraints, I'm simply going to refer to some excerpts from the poem. By approaching the analysis from a multidisciplinary analysis in the areas of legal, socio-historical and analytical media and literature, I hope to present a more holistic analysis of the media's narrative. Now, I'm not going to be looking at the legal merit of a case for or against assets because I'm not an international law judge, but the point is, neither is the United States. Okay, so just before we start, in 1899, Kipling wrote a poem entitled The White Man's Burden, and it justified the colonisation of the Philippines because of humanitarian grounds. International law has developed greatly since then. Legally, each nation state is entitled to what's called state sovereignty. Now, it's, it's really hard to define state sovereignty, so just bear with me in my attempt to do it. So it's the right to make decisions unencumbered. State sovereignty refers to the concept of a state's autonomy and the ability to make decisions on behalf of its people unhindered by external factors. The difficulty lies in balancing conflicts. So, sorry, if you look at Lady Justice holding the scales of justice, the whole point of 
Lady Justice is that she is trying to balance the two competing rights in any legal argument. So if you're looking at criminal law, it's the right of the defendant to a fair trial and the right of the victim. So when it comes to international law, you are looking at trying to balance sovereignty of the state on one side and international law's right to have humanitarian, <coughs> humanitarian rights on the other, human rights. But the media's narrative on Syria ignores Syria's legal right to state sovereignty and focuses solely on one aspect of that, which is the humanitarian element. This deliberate ignoring of the legal complexities presents an inaccurate narrative of the Syrian crisis and incorrectly shapes the responders' viewpoint. Now, the complexity of international law is intensified by the fact that the definitions of key concepts are not found in one particular legislation or legal instrument, which goes back to my previous point about why it's so difficult to define it, because there is no actual definition in law. So although it's accepted as an important concept, there's no universal definition. Now, I have a strange sense of humour. I tried to find the United Nations definition of sovereignty because they're the, like, the least sovereign. Sort of body, but they didn't have one. So I went to the New South Wales Department of Education's uh, definition, and it emphasises, you can read this for yourself, it emphasises that Australia is a sovereign nation. It reiterates in the paragraph that only Australia can make decisions regarding itself, and that international law is a choice made by sovereign states. This definition also reiterates that international law is technically non-binding. I found it really interesting that when you're trying to teach New South Wales students, you are pro-state sovereignty when it's from the Australian perspective. That's very important. Let's move on to the next thing. So this is from Chapter 2 of the Charter for the United Nations. It acknowledges the principle of sovereign equality of all its members. And the next article that I screenshot for you it talks about the rights that are owed to sovereign states. Now, one of the rights that I think is very important at the moment is protection of members. Okay? So the idea is that members are protected from attacks. We'll come back to this idea. Uh, although the media tries to legitimize and give authenticity, authenticity, my apologies, to the United States military intervention in Syria by quoting international law experts and United Nations members. The truth is that the United Nations has not authorized military intervention in Syria. Now, experts quoted in non-Western media such as RT have been quoted as saying that this is not legal under international law. That's a URL if you'd like to follow that later. But I also took some quotes from uh, Professor Ben Saul of Sydney University. This is from a Sydney Morning Herald article. He states, military intervention without security council authorization is illegal. There is also no right of humanitarian intervention. There is no right of self-defense in the current circumstances because Syria has not attacked the US or any other country. As was the case in Iraq in 2003, military intervention in Syria would constitute the crime against peace of aggression, in principle attracting international criminal responsibility for political leaders who order an attack. That is the legal words about it. But what the media presents is something completely different. Now, he has an opinion piece also in the Sydney Morning Herald, and I'll just leave that up for you to read while I continue. <coughs> Before you think, though, that his articles protect Syrian sovereignty, although stating that military intervention is illegal, in both of his articles, he still suggests that deposing Assad is the best option. So there is a clear disregard for international law. Okay? He says himself that it's not legal, but he still continues and says we still have to depose Assad. It makes zero sense legal, zero sense. But anyway, let's continue. The white man's burden to save the weak brown man is apparently more important than international law. But do alleged human rights violations give an automatic right for the international community to depose governments? Well, the United States has had numerous violations regarding Guantanamo Bay. 
In 2013, the United Nations found Australia guilty of almost 150 human rights violations regarding refugees alone. And that's not taking into account the treatment of Indigenous Australians, for which Australia has had numerous criticism. Neither the United States nor Australia have received any sanctions, nor to my knowledge have had their governments deposed. It seems that the US and her allies are exempt from the application of international law and are exempt from the legally incorrect narrative that human rights violations end in deposed leaders. So most importantly, my question then is, if the United States of America is responsible for the application of international law, what is the purpose of international law bodies such as the United Nations or international law courts? Don't get worried. Banking we used to be very worried all the time. Oh. <laughs> it needs to figure itself out. But anyway, I'll let you consider that for longer as we keep going. So uh, the propaganda model by Herman and Chomsky aim at analysing corporate media through what they call filters. Herman and Chomsky state that the media serve and propagandise on behalf of powerful societal interests that control and finance them. The representatives of these interests have important agendas and principles that they want to advance, and they're well positioned to shape and constrain media policy. Now, a very interesting point that they make, which was demonstrated in the analysis, which I'll get to in a moment, was their view of the use of experts. They provide experts to confirm the official slant on the news. The same underlying power sources also play a key role in fixing basic principles and dominant ideologies. Now, while dissent does exist, such dissent and coverage of inconvenient information are kept within the bounds and at the margins, so that their presence shows that the system is not monolithic, they are not large enough to interfere unduly with the domination of the official agenda. And I'll get back to these quotes, so if you just want to sort of keep them in your mind, because you'll see them applied in actual <coughs> media articles in a moment. So the first filter is size, ownership and profit orientation. It's important to note that many of the articles I analysed include the ABC, Al Jazeera and Russia Today, which are all state media run and naturally they will be reflective of their respective countries' narrative. Because of time restrictions, we won't go into detail about the owners of the respective media, but there are comprehensive lists available in the Chomsky book, which I have access to if you're interested in seeing that. But suffice it to say that it's a very important aspect of understanding the media's view. Now let's go to what I think is the most interesting and important part of the presentation. So using content analysis, what patterns do we get from the Western media's narrative? So I chose 50 newspaper articles from Syria from 2010 until March 2017 through different Google searches on the premise that this is would be, sorry, this would be what the average reader would be accessing. Now, okay, so I used terms such as Syria, Syrian crisis and Syrian war. I wanted to analyse online articles as there's a surge in people accessing news online and I felt that articles published online would be more likely to continue shaping the narrative. So it's not like it's hard for you, it's harder to get. You still go in there years later, you search it and you still have access to that specific narrative. I only selected articles that were free as I wanted to see what the average person who has an average interest in Syria would be reading. Unfortunately, this meant that I didn't have access to the Australian because a lot of their articles need to be purchased. Now, <laughs> now this um, digital news report in 2015, it confirmed my choices and it found that Australians receive most of their news online. When asked to name their single main source for news, 44% said the internet with television coming second at 35. Social media was also up there, but I didn't go into it because I think that's like a whole presentation in itself. Less than 11% had paid for news in the previous year, and that was why I wanted to get the free articles because, again, most people would, 90% 90, 90 pretty much of people get the free articles. Um, interestingly, in the ABC News article that summarised the findings, about two-thirds of the way down, it stated that audience tracking data suggests only about 10% of the people will scroll that far down in the story of that length. And that's really important because when we come to look at the structure 
of the, um, of the articles about Syria. So for the sake of analysis, I only chose articles that were longer than three or so paragraphs, otherwise I didn't really have anything to analyze. The search was over a period of approximately three months. Okay, so let me just explain something. I wanted to do 50 all up. If you're thinking, why did I, do? I ended up doing 65 all up, and before you think that there's some sort of occult theory, let me just explain to you. I wanted to do 50, so I could just double the number because I'm very bad at maths, and I wanted to just say, you know, 40% of the yeah. article said this. It made sense. But after I finished, I realized that I didn't do the five alternative media, and I realized that there was a pattern that I found that I wanted to test, so I went back and I did another 10. I do have a copy of my findings if you're interested in looking at it. The extra 10 Western media articles are highlighted, so you know which ones I sort of went back to do if you are interested in that. But anyway, let's keep going with that. So, now I'll just give you a bit of a spoiler about what I'm going to talk about. These are a collection of just some of the headlines. Russia has killed more civilians than ISIS as Putin's jets blitz war ravaged Syria. Putin's forces support the Assad regime. We're going to get to that, don't worry. My friends in Aleppo, this is one of my favorites. My friends in Aleppo would rather die than face capture by Assad's militias. <laughs> very, 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 like, awesome. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, all of the 50 Western mainstream media articles that I uh, analyzed refer to the Syrian army as pro-Assad or pro-regime forces, including the articles on the accidental strikes by the US in which Australia was involved that killed the Syrian army soldiers during the ceasefire. There was a gentleman yesterday who during the Q&A session was talking about how loaded the idea of using the words Assad regime is. So imagine how much more so talking about the Syrian army as pro-Assad or pro-regime forces. Within these same articles, four out of 50 articles refer to the word army to describe the Syrian army and one using the word military. Now, there were reasons. So in all 50, they refer to the army as pro-Assad or pro-regime forces. But within those same articles, there was those examples. Now, the first one referred to them as a Syrian army because it was a quote by an, an analyst. The second one because there was an alleged negative action, and the other one was an alleged negative action. That's why they call them the army, because it delegitimizes them even further. So, um, the quote that all kinds of weapons were used, again, and the Guardian in 31, the 31st of October 2016, my apologies, was the closest they talked about a Syrian military because he spoke to their newspaper. So they're trying to give him legitimacy for making those quotes. Otherwise, even in those ones, they do refer to them as pro-Assad militia. So this is the pattern that I found, which is why I went back and I did some extra ones to see if the pattern's still there. From the 28th of November 2016, there were four examples of either neutral or positive references to the Syrian army. Quiz for you. What happened in November 2016? Someone said Trump. Trump. Yes, excellent. Okay, so the elections. Now, as we remember, Trump was elected based on the fact that he promised to leave Syria. So, I honestly, I can't tell you what the media was thinking, but my theory is maybe they were afraid that if he was to get out of Syria, they couldn't really continue that rhetoric and they needed to go with the narrative, the official line. But we don't know because then the chemical attack happened and it went back. But, I mean, that's, that's what it was. So to contrast, all five of the non-Western mainstream media articles refer to the Syrian army. Al Mazda is more specific and differentiates between the army and its specialist type of forces. Western media articles quoted experts for credibility. Uh, they frequently use the United Nations, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, Human Rights Watch, pretty much everything that Dr. Anderson spoke about earlier, and other so called experts. 
So that's just talking about the importance of semantics. So is it the Syrian army or pro-Assad forces, rebels or terrorists? We're going to get to Al Jazeera. Everyone's favourite Al Jazeera is coming up, don't you worry. Okay, so the structure was similar in that all the articles that alleged crimes by Assad three quarters of the way through, they would say that this is only alleged and then quote a source from the other side. Now, if we go back remembering the digital media survey, 90% of the readers wouldn't have gotten to the point where they said that it was alleged and quote another side. So that's really important when looking at that. Now, six articles were solely on the idea that the West has a burden to overthrow Assad and save the Syrians, not including the ones that alluded to it. Those six out of 50 were just on saving the Syrian people. Okay, some notable mentions of articles. Now, let me show you my favourite. This is my favourite article. Please, please watch it. Let me just... The Raqqa water supply restored after airstrike. Who restored it? There's a magic fairy going around restoring water supplies. No, it's the army. But they don't want to say that it's the army. So the whole thing was written in passive language, which is very, very bad writing, by the way, can I just say. You never write passive language. You're supposed to say who did what. But the fact is they wouldn't even say that the Syrian army did something positive. It's just, it's a, it restored itself. It's magic. Alright, let's keep it going. Let's go to my favourite, Al Jazeera. I can't even like, I can't even hide my excitement talking about Al Jazeera. <laughs> it's a special place in my heart for Al Jazeera. You don't understand. Alright, let's keep going. 100% of the Western media's articles and Al Jazeera referred to rebels, while the non-Western referred to them as terrorist groups or armed opposition groups. Okay, again, it's the semantics. Al Jazeera was the most anti-Syrian government, was the most subjective. It frequently wrote articles in first person. They frequently used emotive language and was very photo heavy with emotive photographs. Now, although non-Western media was pro-Syrian sovereignty and anti-US intervention, it did try to have some degree of impartiality, at least compared to Al Jazeera. 100% um, of the articles refer to the Syrian army as an army rather than the militia sort of pro-Assad forces idea. And they don't refer to the rebels as does the Western mainstream media, but they refer to them as terrorists. Press TV uses the term Syrian government, which legitimizes Assad. Russia today legitimizes the Syrian army by presenting them in positive light, such as saving civilians from landmines and other planted devices. Al Mazda used the word liberated territories, while <coughs> the Western mainstream used the total opposite, which is captured. Now, I hate that word because you can't capture a city that you or that is yours. Recaptured, I might take. Don't really, I prefer liberated. But can you ever imagine reading in the Sydney Morning Herald that the Australian Army has captured Tasmania? <laughs> Let's keep going. Anyway. Um, Non-Western media articles are shorter and they don't necessarily quote experts. Now perhaps my most surprising finding was that the most critical of the United States and the most defensive of Syrian sovereignty was the Western alternative media. I didn't see that coming, so that was pretty interesting. So uh, the Global Research Canada article was extremely anti-American, highly biased and used emotive language. Out of all of the 65 articles, two articles, and they were both alternative media, referred to Assad winning the last election, which legitimised Assad's fight to remain, and in essence, it delegitimised, sorry, let's try again, delegitimised the United States striking of Syria. Okay, so, those were the two articles, so one was InfoWars and one was from Mint News. Okay, so my research does have limitations that I acknowledge. The main one is the sample size. The second is that different search words render different results. So for example, when I searched Syria, Syrian crisis, Syrian war, those were the 65 that came up. But when I searched legality of Australia's intervention on Syria, that's when the, um, the RT and the Sydney Morning Herald ones that I referred to came up. 
So that does come into it, and I do acknowledge that. Um, Non-Western media and Western alternative media would need to have more examples from a variety of different sources for the results to be truly conclusive. However, I do hope that this has at least shown some patterns in the choices journalists are making on their presentation of the Syrian narrative. The war on Syria has escalated over the past week. However, as we can see by this analysis, it was in the making for quite some time. And the mirage of Syria's sovereignty continues under the pretext of the white man's burden. Thank you so much.